for more on this and the process, I want to bring in former Foreign Affairs Minister Peter McKay. He comes to us from our studios in Toronto. Hi, Mr. McKay. Good to see you. Hello, Jennifer. Good to be with you. Thank you. Could you take us through the process of negotiating the release of a Canadian who is detained in jail in a foreign country? How does it work? Well, no, I couldn't uh, for, for certain reasons that uh, you, you will understand, particularly given that every case is different. In this case, uh, Mr. Baxter was in custody in Syria, and we have no embassy, no consular officials, no ground game, if you will, in terms of that negotiation. And so, as we know now, it was, in fact, Lebanon, the Lebanese government and the Lebanese Security Department that did much of that heavy lifting and intervention. But what very often happens is, depending on who uh, is holding the individual in question, whether it's a government, uh, but very often, as we know, these cases involve terrorist organizations, criminal element, who are trying to uh, elicit a ransom, or worse, they have a political agenda and they're prepared to assassinate or, or torture a person. Um, I would echo the minister's comments in that we're delighted that Mr. Baxter is free and with his family and, and all that means and, and his, his life and his freedom. But it's the prevention here, I think, that we have to emphasize. And uh, Canadians going into jurisdictions, war-torn conflict zones, uh, a place like Syria, uh, I think we really have to emphasize the necessity to just use common sense and do not go there as an adventurer, as a tourist, or otherwise. To that point, the government has been issuing travel warnings for Syria for a number of years. Uh, how seriously do Canadians take these travel warnings? Well, clearly not seriously enough in, in this instance, and uh, that's right. The, the advisory has been on the Global Affairs website since 2011, going back quite a few years, and you only have to watch the nightly news, news to know the, the jeopardy that you can find yourself in. Uh, it's a different world, and it's getting, quite frankly, more dangerous for Canadians to travel. You can take your passport with you in your backpack, but you don't take your Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And you cannot expect the rule of law to prevail. And in some cases, the government itself is very hard pressed, as was exam certainly exemplified here, when we do not have the ability to get consular access mm -hmm. and to make the type of interventions that are necessary. So speaking in general terms, Mr. McKay, because I know you can't reference any one particular case um, directly, but... What is the quid pro quo? What would Canada have to offer or give up to secure a Canadian's release? And obviously, it's dependent on each individual country. Um, but Canada has a policy of not paying ransoms, if I'm, if I'm, you know, uh, if I recall reading. That's correct. But, right. So, what would Canada or could Canada offer in order to get Lebanese, uh, Lebanese officials' help, for example? Well, Lebanon is a country we have a long-standing um, relationship with, and uh, we have a, a very uh, competent consular uh, service there. We have a very wonderful ambassador who I've met. Uh, um, she figured prominently in eliciting the support of the Lebanese government through our Beirut office. And uh, Emmanuel Lamarou is, is somebody who should be congratulated today among the, the, the other officials who, who were involved. But what we often do is uh, we invoke the help of other countries, allies, like-minded countries. And what is on offer, obviously, Jennifer, is that we would do the same for them. Mm -hmm. And we would, uh, you know, obviously try to assist their citizens in ways that are important, that are impactful. Um, it isn't so much a quid pro quo, as you put it, as it is, it is the sort of the relationships that you have, the ongoing support network that is in place, and the fact that we uh, covet those relationships when citizens from other countries are also in need of our help. And so that, uh, that type of network does exist. Like-minded countries uh, who we have assisted in the past, particularly in this brave new world where th those threats are, are so insidious and so personal. Mm. And we have seen lots of instances where a lot of money is expended, not necessarily in terms of ransom, but in terms of preparation, in terms of the caseload and the work that's put in. And frankly, having a bit of a defense and security background as well, it often involves uh, using our, our special forces, our, our individuals who are able to go and help rescue hostages in a very dangerous situation. Yeah. So again, something for Canadians to contemplate 
when they're going into these places where they're exposed and where they're vulnerable. You know, there's an irony here um, that we don't have diplomatic relations with Syria at this time, yet we managed to secure the release of a Canadian there who was arrested. We have two Canadians arrested in China on what's believed to be trumped-up charges. We supposedly have diplomatic relations with China, but those two men are still languishing behind bars. Yeah, that certainly crossed my mind today as well. And, and it goes, it speaks to how the changing dynamics in the world um, make Canadians pause and, and contemplate where they want to be and, uh, and what it means and the jeopardy that they may find themselves, whether it's in, in China, whether it's in Russia, whether it's in certain parts of the Middle East. Uh, and in this case, Syria was, uh, was a place that should have been obvious, uh, not, to, uh, not to turn too much attention only to Syria. But there are many other countries now that one just a few short years ago wouldn't have really thought about as, as being places that they would be in jeopardy, mm -hmm. China being one of them. And uh, it is a very lamentable situation that uh, we have two Canadians that are now in custody in China on what are very spurious charges that uh, our Canadian government has been very hamstrung in their efforts in trying to help secure their release. Former Foreign Affairs Minister Peter McKay, appreciate your time today. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Jennifer.